Greetings, and welcome to this short video series, Giants in L&D, for 2021, where our focus this year is on research. Our guest, Clark Quinn, and we've asked him to share with us 10 to 15 minutes on one area of research that he believes all L&D practitioners should be aware of. Before we launch into that, Clark, would you please take a minute or two to introduce yourself and your topic and share with us a little bit about your related background? Sure, Guy, and thanks for the opportunity. What I wanna to talk today about are learning design processes, which is a combination of learning science and design. And I've looked at both of those deeply. So I'm, you know, work through Quinnovation to help organizations do this. And in my background, I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate design my own major. It's been my career ever since. After designing and programming educational computer games, I realized we didn't know enough and I went back to get a PhD in applied cognitive science. And my lab at the time was looking at interface design. So they were looking at design practices and how to design for the way people think. And my twist on that was designing for how people learn. And so I've been throughout my career, I've continued to look at what do we know about learning? What do we know about design? And what do they tell us we should do better? Clark, thanks for that. Given your expertise in learning design processes, how does that inform, affect, or support learning and development? Well, Overall in learning and development, I don't think we do near enough to be aligned with what we know about how our brains work. I don't think we are focused on how we think, how we work, how we learn. We're stuck sort of in that old mentality of the brain is this formal computer and we, that leads us to a lot of mistakes. So this covers everything from you know learning design to job aids to, to facilitating informal learning. But I wanna specifically talk about learning design today. And um, that again is the intersection of learning science and design practices. So let's start with the learning science side, something I've been tracking since those <laughs> early days. I hate to tell you how many decades away ago. And there's many ways we go wrong and we start with just the wrong objectives. And Guy, you're one of the uh, proponents of performance consulting and not designing learning except when that makes sense. There are other performance barriers that we have other solutions for, but when we end up finding out it's a true skill need, then we should be designing a learning experience. And even when we do that, we don't go in and get the right objectives, for instance. We, first of all, we throw you know, learning at situations where that's not the best solution, but even when we do, we oftentimes end up listening to the subject matter expert. And as your buddy uh, Richard Clark suggests from his work at USC's Cognitive Technology Group, experts can't tell you 70% of what they do, but they know what they know. And there's a lot of knowledge dump and a good little instructional designer will go, oh, okay, I'll make sure they know that. But instead we really need to focus on what they do and we need to dig deeper to get there. So there's an initial breakdown. And then when we do that, we don't necessarily make the right practice. Well, of course, if we're focused on a knowledge objective. We do knowledge practice, but we really need performance practice. We need sufficient practice. Learning science tells us that we need to space it out over time and we need to vary it to get the best likelihood of it being there when we need it. As you know, learning goals are Two goals for learning really are retention over time until it's needed and transfer to all appropriate, no inappropriate situations. And that retention over time comes from practice and it depends on you know, how complex it is and how frequently we perform it in the real life and how important it is. Um, if we get it wrong, what does it cost? But we need to ensure that we're providing sufficient practice and varied practice and developing that practice and complexity until we get the person to the level where they're confident to perform. So, we aren't designing practice and then we aren't necessarily creating the right content. We aren't focusing on what's the minimal content that will allow you to succeed. What are the nuances of the feedback? So there are a lot of ways in which we're going wrong in terms of design. And that's not even beginning to address the emotional side and learning science is now telling us that the meaningfulness of it matters. It sticks better if we care. And yet we're not building in the what's in it for me to make sure, help people understand why this is important. We just tell them it's important instead of making that personal connection. And we're not managing anxiety uh, levels to make sure it's safe to learn. And we increasingly recognize that 
We learn to minimize gaps, but we won't invest unless the cost is lower than the cost of the outcome. And so we need to make it safe so we're willing to experiment and address these learning. So there are a lot of facets of learning science that are, have been established. And all the neural stuff that's coming out isn't you know, necessarily helpful yet. Uh, most of the, pretty much all the results that we get for learning science come from the cognitive level. So we want to apply those. We want to make learning experiences that matter. So to do that, we need learning design processes that actually work most effectively as well. Our cognitive architecture is incredibly powerful, but it has some limitations. So we have problems doing rote things. We tend to solve new problems the way we solved old problems. And we tend to use tools in limited fixed ways instead of exploring how they might be used in creative unnecessary ways, not unnecessary and unusual ways and creative ways. So how do we break out of that? Well, we also have a lot of knowledge about what works in design. And that includes when to be divergent and open and when to converge and, and control. And yet, you know, and now we're beginning to see design thinking talk about these pr practices as a consolidation of a lot of stuff that we've known over time. It just puts a nice uh, wrapping on it. And that's fine. That's great if it gets people to pay attention. But too often, the problems we see in our design processes are we will give people a tool and send them off on their own with a bunch of content and expect them to come back in two weeks with a full course that's a bunch of content dump and some meaningless trivial quizzes. And that's not gonna lead to any meaningful behavior change. So how do we get to design process? Well, part of it's you know setting appropriate expectations about what the design process should be and how it can provide outputs. But then we need to know when should people interact with others to prevent sort of the uh, premature convergence on a solution and to broaden out the diversity and explore other possible solutions that might be better. We need to get out of that waterfall model that just says if we build it, it is good. We get into an iterative model that says, yes, we're going to test it and we're going to refine it because people aren't like concrete our properties aren't that predictable. And so we really need to consider that our initial solution will be a best guess based on principle, but it won't be perfect and it can be improved and it should be improved if it matters. Now this isn't that much different than existing design practices. It's refined, so it shouldn't cost that much more, but it's take a bit more, but we should not we should be using it less because it's only when we put things into the head and need to put them into the head. A lot of times we could and should be putting things into the world. That's part of a different talk <laughs> about what uh, research also tells us. But we need to know when should we be social and when, and when we're social, how to be social. So much of our practices are mistaken. So I've talked previously about brainstorming and how for a period a few years ago, suddenly there were articles saying brainstorming didn't work. And that's because the original proposal for brainstorming was flawed. But we have new brainstorming practices that work, even if they call them under, under ter other terms. We know about when you get people together, you should have their, um, you know, they should think about the problem independently. Instead of bringing them together, give away the problem and immediately start talking, you need everybody to generate. So there are a variety of practices in our design approach, in our design processes, that will lead to better outcomes. And yet we need to know what they are and figure out how to build them into our practices without the group, you know, very few people are going to totally throw out what they do and start afresh. Instead, how can we fine tune what we're doing? Because most of it's okay, it just needs a fine tuning and these critical points drastically increase the quality of the output for a minimal in intervention in the existing approach. So these are the things you know, that research tells us that we can do better on our learning pedagogy. It's not andragogy, pedagogy. <laughs> and um, in the practices we use to apply those to create the solutions we need. That's, I think, something that uh, uh, L&D needs to be aware of and needs to invest the effort to remedy to be getting it right. Art, thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us today and for your contributions to the profession in general. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Guy, and thanks everybody who's watching this.